is a series of uh, Leading Resilience by New Woman Connector. My name is Anila Noor and I'm so happy to moderate this session and we have uh, amazing speakers today. Uh, the topic uh, that today for us is new resilience and new vulnerabilities. Before going to in our discussion and uh, introduction of New Woman Connector and about the specific uh, our topic for today and uh, for the follow up, I really request everyone, please feel free to share the, your comments, your question in the chat box and the house rules are try to keep your mic off uh, until you request it to speak and uh, share your feedback and everything. And uh, now we're going to start it. So thank you so much for joining. And as I said, uh, today we have a, a session on new vulnerabilities and new resilience, uh, which is part of our serious uh, 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 leading resilience. Uh, uh, because as a refugee and migrant living in Europe, we felt we will be ignored and we will be presented always as a vulnerable. And especially a few days ago, a few weeks ago, we had refugee week and in refugee week, Still, um, I personally experienced uh, when people were talking about refugees, they were just putting them as a vulnerable or people who are in need. Yes, they are in people in the need, but they never highlighted uh, the problems or policy who are failing them, the system who are ignoring them, the um, systematic racism, which is uh, putting them in that kind of mystery. That's why we are uh, uh, talking about this. And so far, I'm going to share um, uh, uh, very quickly uh, about New Woman Connector, who we are and why we are doing this. So I'm just put a slide about New Woman Connectors. So uh, as I said, we are a refugee and migrant-led, woman-led uh, organization. And uh, uh, we are trying to change the perspective uh, shift uh, and advocate uh, 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 for the inclusion rather than in integration. And we are trying to give access to the opportunity to refugee and migrants, especially women across the Europe and across the globe. And we really felt as a refugee and migrant led organization, there is absence of migrant voices in the policy and decision making. No one is asking about um, this lack of uh, opportunity where they can come and discuss the policy. And that's what we are trying to give a platform where they feel uh, more involved. Uh, in all the uh, policy debates and the designing and discussion, we're really trying to make, uh, to ensure the over, all overlooked uh, and unheard voices of migrant and refugees, especially women, they should be there, they should be have a seat on the table. And we're really trying to demonstrate uh, in our work to translate these lived experience of refugee and migrant in the policies to indicate uh, what kind of gaps and what kind of recommendation they really want to have it. So our approach is, is really simple. We are presenting our voice as a, our right, and uh, we are uh, trying to avoid tokenization. Like we, if we are being invited to share our story, it shouldn't be just a storytelling, but it's more than that. And uh, we are trying to give a open platform where refugee and migrant feel connected and own the discussion of, uh, of uh, policies in Europe. And uh, especially in the COVID, as you see, uh, it's changed everything. So that's why we also change, uh, uh, improve our advocacy and we launch our uh, digital help desk, uh, which is uh, trying to monitor and support uh, the impact of COVID-19, especially on refugee and migrant women living in Europe. And we are conducting this series of webinars and we also launch our WhatsApp groups to help refugee and migrant women in eight languages. The languages are Spanish, Arabic, uh, English, uh, Pashto, Dari, Urdu, Hindi, and Punjabi, and where they feel safe to talk about it. And it's just like a sisterhood reflection, which we want to create, like they are not alone. So we really want to give the message. We are coping together, growing together. And we also having um, our uh, co-partners, like we are one who are trying to give them um, uh, help on mental health issues if they have, and we also have a, a digital partner of Code to the Change who are trying to give a strategy advice on how we can reach more and more about uh, 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 with a vulnerable group which has been ignored with the in this digitalization era. So this is was my quick talk. I'm gonna stop my to share my screen, and it's quite hot here today. <laughs> 
I'm trying to cope this and yeah. So thank you so much for everyone. And I'm so excited to introduce about our uh, topic today. And this is very close to my heart because who is vulnerable and who is not, who is resilient and how, especially in the whole debate of migration, people are talking about and always putting refugee and migrant as a vulnerable, not talking about their resilience. And that's what we're gonna um, talk about in this topic. We have a four, amazing um, speakers with us today and uh, um, first speaker uh, Juliana who is joining us from uh, Brussels uh, she's a senior advocacy officer as NR and co-founder of Re uh, Revi Bira sorry Juliana if I'm pronouncing it <laughs> wrong and then we have a second speaker uh, Dr. Amanda who is assistant professor of media and migration and she's also Vice Chair of Intercultural Communication Division. And third amazing speaker, she's um, Amrin Slim. She's a researcher uh, and she's studying uh, in, uh, migrant and refugee women living in specifically in Netherlands. Um, and then we have Lara, she's joining us very early morning for her from USA. And uh, Lara, she is also assistant professor of political science of global affairs at the University of Portland. So I will start my uh, talk um, and request Juliana to start the talk uh, about what's going on and how we need to uh, improve this resilience and to uh, asking, uh, especially the media and the policy don't present refugee and migrants uh, as a vulnerable. And because your experience, you have expertise on gender-based violence, you have huge experience on um, migration, integration, and uh, racism, you are trying to launch this uh, campaign and you are working a lot in Brussels. So what do you think about this COVID or before COVID or post COVID, how these policies are uh, trying uh, to make discrimination and how the way they put refugee and migrant in their debate. So Juliana, over to you. Thank you very much, Anila. It's a pleasure to be here with so uh, many fantastic women. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you for the trust in the work of INAR. I would like to know if it's possible to share a screen. Yes, I think yes. you can, you can, yes. Yeah. Um, I will try to um, do this presentation from the perspective of um, racialized minorities um, in Europe. And when I mean racialized minorities, I mean um, people of African descent, Roma, Muslim, Jews, and of course, migrants. I hope you can share, you can see my screen already. Uh, so yes. first of all, I represent the European Network Against Racism. We are a network of more of 150 uh, organizations working at the national level. We are uh, based in all member states plus UK, Turkey, Iceland, and Macedonia. And I'm here today to talk about racism, which uh, seems to be a kind of the um, topic of the moment. And we hope that we are, in, we are seizing this moment to have a pivotal change, to have a new area where racism is really gonna be taken in consideration as a matter of concern and priority. So when I talk here today, again, I'm talking about racialized groups, including migrants. And why racialized groups, including migrants? Because racism is a social construction. And we know that migrants uh, are racialized people. In this process of racialization, it means in this process of exclusion based on a ground of ethnicity, um, um, nationality, origin, we are a, national, a racialized group. So, we are here also trying to understand how EU, because we're talking about the EU context, right? How EU uh, has been framing the question of racism and discrimination against migrants uh, from a racial equality perspective, but also from a migration integration perspective. And there is only one perspective, is that we put a lot the focus on the individuals. We hear, we monitor, we create frames, we uh, address policies to tell them only how individuals discriminate individuals, 
or how individuals discriminate individuals in their own capacity or the capacity of a company, of an institution, and so on and so forth. However, racism has four dimensions that are interlinked, intersect, and we cannot disassociate. It goes beyond the individual. It's about talking about the structural barriers, the institutional barriers, and talk about the historical um, challenge, the past abuse, that comes within the company of racism. So I want just to flag out that how we worked during the COVID. Of course, we are working from home, um, trying to protect ourselves being safe and well, but also analyzing how did it impact migrants and other racialized minorities. And we had an assumption, like um, we are an evidence-based um, advocacy organization. So you use research as a base of our uh, recommendations of our analysis and then we decided then we have a question is COVID affecting minorities disproportionately and how are we going to do it with this question we said yes I, we think it, then we're going to have a, a immense impact but how are we going to do it we're going to go back to our membership and collect incidents of um, racial discrimination and here we are talking about sectorial approach so how migrants and racialized minorities were discriminated in the field of employment, health, housing, mobility, but also the increase of manifestation of racism as racial profiling. Unfortunately, we have seen also um, under the COVID incidents like George Floyd. We also have had our George Floyds in Europe. We have uh, Adil in Belgium, we had Mohammed in France. Uh, we have many cases in which victims die under um, police brutality in the context, in the frame of security and health uh, during the pandemic. So, and what would you want to achieve with that is to prove that the structural barriers uh, would prevent migrants to fully access service and safeguard rights. So, with the map, we try to see if we would live in a pandemic or if we were in a pandemonium or were we opening a Pandora box? So it means is something isolated, is something structural, or is something new? So uh, for many, for our surprise, um, the results uh, were not different from our assumptions. So it, the results showed exactly that um, there is a lack of structural institutional racism covered by Nero's report before the COVID they were duplicated and being done also during the pandemic. So this is the map. We have more than 250 cases. Each dot represents an incident against a racialized group. In the regions, you're going to see that there is an overall representation of violence against migrants, of course, in countries of um, arrival, like Italy, um, Greece, Portugal, um, and then also a question of police abuses and how people are controlled in the street because they look like migrants or they are from a minority. And what are the key findings? In housing, the key finding is that, especially for migrants, here we are seeing a dilemma of the crisis. Even we are uh, talking about uh, migrants being exposed to um, COVID because they live in an overpopulated area or because they were facing evictions from the places they were, they, were, they were placing, where they were displaced. So here what you saw is a lack of alternative of housing, especially for migrants and migrant women. And do not forget migrant children. And the question of police abuse, again, migrants are over-policed and under-protected. So we have seen many manifestations of hate speech, hate crime, we also have seen a lot of hate, racial profiling, controlling in the borders, who has the right to enter, who has the right to stay out of, of, the, of the borders. How much violence can we use to, um, to push back these people from our territory? So again, this is not something new. It just came a norm because under COVID, we could normalize brutality. And then hate speech, which is a fuel for hate crimes. It's very difficult to prove that racist speech leads to hate crime but what we see is that hated speech they are they frame the context of violence so it's very important to understand that so we have seen people that were uh, spat on uh, they were attacked uh, in the face um, 
many faces of uh, many cases of individuals who were being shouting at. And this case, for example, of the Malaysian migrant study in Tallinn, she was wearing a mask, and because she was wearing a mask, she was discriminated. And she said, "I was just trying to protect myself and the others, and instead of that, I was I was threatened with prejudice and ignorance." And this is the reality of many people in Europe. And of course, anti-Asian racism escalated. Um, and in the end, it's also the question on how employment and healthcare um, is accessible or is also a platform of discrimination. So migrants here, they are at the task force of domestic care. They are uh, ca caregivers, but they are also were exposed to a lack of access to um, to the health system in sometimes in many moments, especially when you talk about undocumented migrants, when you talk about asylum seekers without the full uh, uh, um, documented uh, package. So here, people could not access the labor market, or they were being exposed as, as employees in the uh, healthcare sector. Um, I just want to touch upon police brutality because police brutality, people think that we are, um, that's something new in Europe. No, it's not something new in Europe. Um, especially, it's not an isolated context. What is the difference of police brutality in Europe and the US? Why George Floyd um, was so instrumental to the fight of racism in Europe? Because um, it was a moment where we could say, this is not only an uh, isolated event in the US, this is also the reality in Europe. And there are many reports, there, are many, there is many evidence, so why are you not taking a look at it right now? So this was a window of opportunity for us. Um, what is important as well to know is that why police brutality is not um, covered in Europe. First of all, because the media does not cover cases of police brutality against minorities. They would cover police brutality um, against um, other forms of discrimination, but when it comes to black people, people of colors and migrants, it usually the criminalization of, migra of migrants that is seen is often the, the migrant as a danger that is seen, not as a victim of racism. Second of all is the data. In Europe, despite the UK, there are not, most of the countries do not disaggregate data by race, ethnicity, and migrant status. So we are in a visible group. So if you're not counted by the statistics, we don't count. So it seems that the implications of police brutality and violence on us, they don't, do not exist. The third point is where we are here today, mobilization. Um, there is a maturity uh, in the civil society movement in the US that we still do not have in Europe. Um, there is a level of mobilization that, of self-mobilization that the US has attained, that the EU hasn't attained yet. Um, in the US, we are very able to mobilize independently very fast. In Europe, we need more instructions, we need more guidance, and we need someone to lead, to take the lead of that. So that's why it's very important to talk about the concept of racism today, but bringing again that the future response needs to bring structural changes. They need to bring structural um, dynamics institutional responsibilities, because otherwise we're going to just reproduce inequalities. I would just want to approach a proposal the EP resolution approved last um, week. It is a um, crucial instrument. It's an important decision. It's the agreement of the, of the uh, parliament and the students say, we acknowledge there is racism. We acknowledge there is no problem and we have to do something. But on the other hand, is a good beginning, but it's not perfection. So we would like to see more engagement with civil society. We would like to see other manifestations of racism covered by the, all the, the future instrument. Just to give an example, the question of brutality in the EU borders, the question of brutality of migrants, they were not covered by these resolutions. So we need to address that in a more European um, common agenda, not only on migration, but also in the field of racial justice. And that's why intersectionality is important, because we need to bring the racial element on policies related to migration and gender and extra, even artificial intelligence. And in the other way, we have to bring the migrant perspective into the racial justice fight, 
Do not forget that discrimination based on nationality for third country nationals is not a ground of protection under the legislation, the EU legislation. So I'll stop here. I'd like to continue the discussion afterwards and thank you for this opportunity, Anila and friends. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you for sharing that intensive uh, and you know detailed uh, um, survey. It's really uh, timely. Uh, and I will uh, go to the uh, our next speaker because it's very relevant, uh, Juliana, which you said, the media representation and everything. And our next speaker, she is the expert of communication and she's head, uh, vice chair of the uh, Intercultural Communication Division and um, media and narrative of resilience and vulnerability. She's uh, teaching and I think, uh, Amanda, I'm coming to you and we love to hear about your research and your analysis and what you have to share about how COVID is uh, creating more problems uh, about uh, refugee and migrant all debates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anila, for the introduction and thank you again for this uh, for the invitation to this amazing, insightful, but also timely uh, webinar. Uh, also, it's a pleasure uh, to be joining this discussion with uh, this group of amazing women. Um, I would like to answer your question, Anila, by um, providing sort of a, a bit of an overview of uh, the kinds of media frames that are out there when it comes to, to the coverage of migration. If I may also, I would like to share a few slides because it helps to visualize some of those frames. Yes, I think we're, let me see. One second. Mm, yeah, I will position it correctly. All right. Um, Let's, let's begin this way. When we talk about, uh, when the media talks about migrants uh, or refugees, uh, the frames, and this has also already been um, proved by different researchers and different contexts, there is always this frame of um, who are the refugees, who are the migrants, right? They are basically portrayed as terrorists. So especially after uh, President uh, Donald Trump uh, has come into power, so there has been this, uh, this constant mobilization in politics, in American politics, about, um, oh, even in the discourses of the presidents, that migrants and refugees, they come to the country um, and they represent a certain threat, right? Um, so even in the slogan, make America safe again, and this, this particular rhetoric has been already, has been also um, you know, has also gained uh, echo in, in European media too, especially among uh, populist media. Um, migrants are also seen and portrayed as the illegal ones, the unwanted invaders. So there's also a very common frame uh, when it comes to covering refugees and migrants entering Europe, US and also other countries. The economic burden uh, is another frame that has also been particularly predominant in media because this gives the idea that migrants, they come and they will utilize, uh, well, the benefits that the state offers. And so there's this, this vision that has been also um, permeated in media about uh, migrants becoming, right, a particular burden for a welfare systems, stealing jobs, and uh, another kind of, of frame that has been also particularly predominant in media is about migrants representing a particular threat to society's cultural value. We talk about secular Western societies, right? So if you remember back in 2017, during the uh, French election period, um, there was this, uh, this particular law, the Burkini, the Burkini ban, and uh, so photos of, uh, of women with, uh, with scarves, but also wearing, uh, they, were, they were actually prohibited from wearing the, the burkini on French beaches. So these frames were also perpetuated uh, in the media back then saying that, yeah, you have to adapt to, to, 
to the, the values of our society and etc. So this, famous, this frame is also particularly resonant in Western media. I'm not gonna extend so much. This is just to give an overview. Um, and finally, I wanna reach to the point of the victimization. And when it comes to women with a migrant or refugee background, the frame or uh, this, this narrative of women as victims uh, oppressed by their own culture and religion is something that uh, has been, you know, largely um, represented in, um, well, in European media and Western media in general. And this is not new, we know that, and it's in particular when Anila was mentioned in the beginning uh, of this webinar, we need to challenge, we need to change these narratives, but um, that's not so simple, right? Precisely because um, uh, uh, media narratives, they have a strong influence on the way people perceive migration, the way people perceive migrants. And uh, studies have also already found uh, evidence for strong correlation between media coverage and attitudes towards migrants and refugees. And in particular, this extensive news coverage also leads to the success of these populist narratives and the rise of anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, I will skip this slide because I want to go back to the victimization point. And when we talk about these media narratives that portray uh, in particular women as victims, we have to think that um, what kind of responsibilities, what kind of, uh, um, well, us as, uh, as part of, of this, uh, of civil society, what kind of responsibilities do we also have, right, in terms of trying to challenge these frames? And when it comes to, uh, to media narratives, there have been a lot of initiatives uh, trying to implement intercultural uh, trainings, intercultural courses for journalists to understand right, the realities, to contextualize, and to give more emphasis on individual stories of migrants, of migrant women. Uh, but also us as collective, we do have a responsibility over that. And this responsibility uh, can be associated with our critical perspective with our capacity to problematize and to question those frames. And um, what I wanted to say with, uh, with my presentation is that, and this is not a new uh, perspective, but I do believe that uh, the, uh, the care ethics uh, approach, adopting a care ethics understanding or perspective on media narratives of migration can be can offer at least a pathway uh, for us to uh, first uh, take more responsibility over uh, or, or over these kinds of media narratives we are exposed, especially if we are if we have the background or uh, the position in which we can actually challenge those and also um, and more important what we can do in terms of action to challenge those, right? We've seen uh, a lot of very important social media initiatives that actually challenge those mainstream narratives. There are, I mean, a lot of, uh, uh, well, platforms, and it's, I think even the New Women Connectors have been really going, um, uh, mobilizing in that sense. And, um, and, and I do think that this is one important form of resilience and we need to, um, you know, continue doing those, uh, taking those actions. But as uh, Juliana mentioned before, we need more than that, right? We need uh, structural changes. We need to change narratives that are not only at the level um, of, of social media, which is an important step, but all, not only at the level of uh, mainstream media narratives, but as a collective ad, and that can indeed bring uh, an important or significant change at the policy level. Um, Hannah Arendt uh, talks about uh, the, the orders of appearance, right? The spaces of appearance, who, who has actually a voice, right? Who is seen, 
who is actually, who is there, who has a space to be seen and a space to be heard. And um, a very interesting observation when we talk about resilience, Anila, is that we need to foster more narratives about, uh, well, that really highlights uh, the empowerment, uh, the, the resilience uh, aspect of, uh, of migrant women um, and, and different contexts. Uh, but we have to take into account that we need more than this too. It is important to really highlight uh, the, 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 the particularities and the needs of, uh, of, of these uh, women, right? Uh, Contextualization, provide more background information, uh, provide more reasons for potential problems that are associated with, uh, with challenges of integration for, for these women. Uh, and it is, we should also uh, hold different actors accountable for their actions too, right? So those narratives that portray uh, women as resilient or women as victims, there is indeed a need for uh, providing this, uh, for, for actually providing this focus on the way the various actors are involved and contribute to perpetuate those, uh, those frames. And more important, and the final point is, um, what are the implications the, the, the real implications of, uh, of a portraying, of, of providing positive approaches and, uh, and practice, right? We need to mobilize those narratives, but we also need to think about how can we move beyond that? How we can actually bring about changes, real implications that can in fact uh, enable, um, uh, well, uh, f fair, more just futures, more just uh, realities. And to finalize with my, uh, with the question about the COVID in the beginning, we've seen uh, different narratives around, uh, well, in the media, different media narratives around migrants, the role of, of, of refugees of, uh, and during this period. And uh, as Juliana mentioned, the assumptions about minorities, um, of, of, of different, different groups, right? The assumptions that they would be the ones actually uh, suffering the, the greater, the, the, more, the most negative consequences during this pandemic uh, were actually confirmed. And we've seen that in different, um, um, well, media narratives, not only in Europe, but also in, in the US and elsewhere. Um, but at the same time, we've seen uh, a certain visibility in mainstream media regarding the role of migrants, the role of migrant women in this crisis, right? As healthcare workers, as, as people who are really providing, uh, well, supplying the chains and providing, uh, well, food and et cetera, and, and, and basic services, essential services for our societies. And, okay, whether uh, these uh, frames, these media narratives are important because they show indeed resilience, they show uh, you know, they, they give voice, so to speak, but, and, and I will end my presentation with a question to you. Um, these narratives, they indeed, they illustrate the fractures of, uh, of the system that do not integrate, that do not um, recognize diversity as it should be. So in context of crisis, we've, uh, we've come across these narratives. They are important, but to what extent, right, they will be perpetuated. They will actually bring implications, as I mentioned before, positive implications uh, that can indeed bring significant changes and the changes that we want to see uh, for migrants and, and refugees and different minority groups in our societies. Thank you very much. I hope I thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Uh, it's really informative and uh, it, some kind of. I always feel it's just a, like like a reminder. Whatever you said, we need more than this, and it, it's just uh, bringing to our next speaker, uh, Amrin Sleem, who is a, a decolonial feminist and a PhD researcher at 
international social uh, studies at Rasmus University. As I mean, I know you um, you have been uh, engaged and working and studying uh, refugee and migrants uh, women, especially in Europe, very closely from last few years. And we would like to hear from you because we have uh, like in Juliana, she really map out the situation of COVID nineteen impact on the migrant uh, in the European countries and. Uh, and then I really talk about the uh, media representation. I really want to hear from you what you are saying if we come, you know, narrow down our uh, scope and really want to understand what refugee and migrant women are saying individually and what's their perspective and why we are not understanding what they are saying and how we need to understand their stories, their voice as an indicator to highlight the gaps. Why, why it's not happening? So over to you, Amreen. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Anila. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, special thanks for organizing this very important conversation and for providing the opportunity to share my work and my research uh, with the refugees and migrants. Uh, today, within the broad theme of migration, I will focus on the relevance of a specific research method in shaping the narratives. I will navigate between my research completed and research in progress with the refugee and migrant women in the Netherlands. Um, I will zoom into the relevance of stories in framing the narratives around migrants and refugees, in highlighting the vulnerabilities they face and resilience they demonstrate during integration, and the significance in times of COVID-19, as the topic of today's discussion revolves around COVID-19. So I'll bring in some aspects from my research. Um, my research collaborators will accompany me as we walk these journeys together. So they will be with me uh, as I share my work. My research, uh, my discussion refers to the significance of stories in at least two broad ways. First, the public perception in shaping the lived realities and everyday experiences of migrants and refugees during settling down and during the course of economic and social integration in host countries, how vulnerable they become how they feel, how it actually looks like in the life of migrants and refugees. And second, the public policy, because while conducting research that informs public policy, it matters who is doing the research, who's interpreting, and more importantly, who's on the table, who's speaking. I refer to research that questions the hierarchies during the research process and is conducted as collaborative research for the co-creation of knowledge with the refugees and migrant populations. So in a way, I'm talking about the decolonial onto epistemological approach. This is when the research is a collaborative endeavor and we move together. It is significant as it informs the public policy affecting the migrants and refugees and the vulnerable groups. I would like to begin with the premise that the encounter of migration is an allegorical waiting space a liminal space in which human identities are either blurred or reside in gray areas. As an art appreciator, to me it seems an outsider may view newcomers in a way similar as an art historian may look at painting by any unknown painter from the past, looking at the hairstyles or costumes to place the subject in a context, perhaps in hints at the moral values of the subject. When I, as a migrant and researcher, encounter the common narrative and public perception, I think to myself, who knows what? What counts and discounts as knowing? How do we know what we know? What narratives sketch vulnerabilities and resilience? It's not easy. These three words tell the story of almost all migrants and refugees. In my research, I've heard it multiple times, and I'm sure many of us here would agree with me. I would like to begin with some excerpts shared by refugees and migrants during my recent qualitative and collaborative research, aiming to understand the negotiations of women during integration in the Netherlands. Aisha, 41 years old migrant woman from Iraq, shared her grandmother's advice, and I quote, Certain foods, when cooked over a slow, long fire, produce the best flavors. But there are some things that I can't wait to end. These strict deadlines and the inborkering exam tops that list these days." End quote. Sana, a 36 years old 
refugee from Syria, shared her feelings as, and I quote, the time at Dutch Tal School, the language school, has been amongst the tensest times of my stay here. I don't understand why it is made mandatory with strict time limitation. Right now, we have a plethora of issues requiring immediate attention and time. I have to get the equivalence for my educational certificates from Syria. See, my children have adjustment issues at school. I need to find a way to generate income for household expenses. And my mother needs psychological help in settling down here. And these are my immediate problems needing my time now. So these are some of the stories that many refugees and migrants would relate to. And the conversations walk us through the intimate details of life experiences as well as perspectives of women. It shows many aspects of life of a refugee that are relevant for the discussion today. First of all, all of them like myself have had to face displacement, adaptation to new home, discrimination and racism as pointed out by Juliana in detail while trying to retain parts of their home culture and struggling to participate in economic and social activities. Then, interestingly, they have all been recipients of local Dutch government's development interventions to integrate them in the Dutch society, such as learning the Dutch language, something that we all have to continue, we all have to do to continue working and living here. The stories highlight what we share in common is the uneasiness towards the time constraints for the mandatory integration, while others pressing issues related to children and family require immediate attention. During my previous research, Fatima, a refugee woman, woman in Rotterdam shared, and I quote, people here don't trust us. They ignore our experiences, our knowledges, and potential contributions in our particular fields. They just tell us, this is what we need to do. And then we must follow a never ending list of milestones to be achieved. The problem is they don't even ask us or want to know what all we know and what all we can do. They just tell us. This is a very powerful statement. And it shows at least three key aspects about the narratives, public perception, and public policy relevant for today's discussion. First, the actual everyday encounters with the narrative that literature on diaspora and migration has constantly depicted about resettlement, that those who migrate are ignorant, less educated, unwilling to contribute, and so on and so forth. Second, it, it shows the stereotypical perception of the migrants and refugees in the society. And third, and most importantly, that the migrants feeling migrants feel distanced and structurally left, left out. As I delve into the aim of today's session, outlined as to feed our side of the story, our narratives to the policies affecting and impacting us who are vulnerable, I related to something that inspired me greatly for my present research, where storytelling comprises the key research method. I would like to point to the significance of stories in highlighting the other side of the coin, which is voices of refugees and migrants. As aforementioned conversations during my research point to at least two key aspects. First, women are uneasy and find the deadlines outlined in policies challenging to follow as they struggle to prioritize different aspects during settling down. And second, the disagreement of women towards the perception that they are any less and need to be re-educated or re-skilled. As they know, they bring education, skills, and professional experiences that can help them be productive members of the whole societies. Here, the key findings direct to the role of stories of and by the women experiencing social challenges and development policy interventions, aiming and integrating them into the host countries. One of my research collaborators shared, and I quote, existing narrative presents us in a way that is not a true representation of us, neither of our reality, but a partial interpretation by someone not from amongst us, end quote. Stories can be an influential way for highlighting small and yet powerful steps towards visibilizing resilience of the vulnerable groups. 
the journey from stories to narratives and from perception to policies directly impacts the everyday lives of migrants and refugees, and particularly during COVID-19. Maurice Wren of Refugee Council UK writes in forward to the book Refugee Stories, and I quote, storytelling is therapeutic. As we can overcome the relentless negativity of the dominant public narrative, simply by enabling people to tell their stories in their way using their words, end quote. I think this is a very powerful quote and she says it all. Um, a better way to understand the world of refugees is to listen to their stories in their own words. It is empowering, it builds bridges, it makes connections and brings healing for the teller as well as for the listener. The objective of stories to share experience, knowledge, skills, ideas, and perceptions is achieved by holding space. In doing so, through the digital platforms, it also contributes to sustaining people-to-people -people interaction within European cities, but also beyond European borders, and in times of travel restrictions and social distancing during COVID-19. By paying attention to how this imagined subject, as a recipient of integration initiatives, is imagined, described, and is referred to in online conversations, stories can be one way to visualize and to identify the potentials and limitations of ongoing actions and initiatives. And with this, I move on to the how question. The mainstream narrative projects migrants and refugees are a burden, but how is this image formed? Where do its origins lie? The key question is, also, how can we support and nurture each other in this process of building bridges and leading resilience to highlight and raise visibility and voice of the ones who are vulnerable? Stories through food, art, culture, festivities, performances, these soft cultural aspects can build bridges between two distinct narratives and reinforce notions of shared public space. What remains invisible is the countless experiences of fruitful encounters that are also taking place on a daily basis. My, re, uh, my present research in progress, um, Solidarity During COVID-19, it's a, uh, just in progress, but I've been talking to people and it shows that mutual support as experienced and expressed by those at the margins of society. These instances contribute to much needed transitions from mainstream narratives of disregard towards challenges of refugees and migrants located at the margins of the society towards visibilization and acceptance of diverse perspectives. One way towards this visibilization and inclusion of voices can be by appreciating stories of valiance. Second, the research shows that stories of marginalized population are not shown as frequently or are put in a negative light, such as the ignoring of the rules set out by the government during the pandemic. And I think we have come across this many uh, in instances uh, on television and media, as Amanda, you also pointed out. Um, stories ranging from businesses providing free meals to community volunteers and concerned family members do exist as well. But could these stories become part of a new and expanded narrative that does not regard these populations as lesser than the dominant ones? Evidence through recent research, for example, by Martinez and Brandon, suggests that the ongoing COVID-19 global pandemic impacts on unfolding across differentiated and specific lines of inclusion and inclusion. Inclusion and exclusion, marked by race, ethnicity, class, gender, and sexuality. It will come as no surprise that immigrant and refugee communities are disproportionately bearing the brunt of these inequalities. How do we not people behind? And the question is, how can we contribute to an expanded view of all members in the cities? How can we bring voices of the vulnerable to the fore? All stories using online platforms can be one way that is connecting and helpful for the vulnerable groups. Tradition and research have shown the power of storytelling and in present times of COVID-19, the power of digital storytelling cannot be ignored. Storytelling in virtual settings about the experiences of resilience and solidarity during the time of COVID-19 restrictions 
and associated increased vulnerabilities can serve as empowering. So in short, various encounters during my research shows the stories outline small steps of a journey and lead from statements to strategies, from silencing to seeing and listening to alternative voices, from invisibilized to inform, from resisting towards resilience and from hope to holding on. I would like to conclude with a quote from one of my research collaborator that articulates the refugee side of the story, questioning the dominant narrative. And I quote, we are resilient. We are transition and as we, we are in transition and as we move from a possibility of a violent ending to a hopeful new beginning of becoming a community of companionship to reconfigure a better world for all of us. We believe in our passion, and this is something to be felt by the people around us." End quote. And I stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amin, for sharing this Zoom in discussion and the voices, uh, which is really highlighting all the situation of refugee and migrant, especially women who are living here. And I really like to little bit zoom out because our next speaker, Dr. Laura Zuzana, she will share about as Amrin, you said, she, she will also highlight neither footnote nor text, refugee women in migration discourse and politics and how we got here and how to move forward. So Dr. Laura, thank you so much for joining us. You've been uh, teaching in political science and global faith at University of Portland in USA. And we really like to listen from your own experience, uh, you know, of migration, gender, especially, uh, and uh, human rights, but what you think are going on, uh, how you map out the whole situation of refugee and migrant women living in Europe. Over to you, Dr. Laura. Thank you so much, New Women uh, Connectors, for, for having me. It really is a true honor to be among such inspirational speakers to address such an important topic. So as a scholar, activist, and educator, and as mentioned, as a migrant woman myself, resilience really has been a profound mantra as I navigate through life. And resilience to me really means not only adapting in moments of distress, but also rising above and beyond. Resilience as a term and notion has had a turbulent past, we could describe it as that, in migration discourse and politics, especially as it pertains to refugee women. Indeed, the state of discourse and politics around refugee women is one of decades of constructing, re- and deconstructing um, identity and agency. So in an opening chapter of uh, Not Born a Refugee Woman, uh, Haja Dukowski, Ahmed, Khanlu, and Musa identify kind of three basic premises that underlie conceptions of refugee women's identity and agency in conventional migration discourse and politics. Refugee as one fits all legal category, refugee women as being uniform, as having one common experience, and refugee women as vulnerable. So these three kind of basic premises have framed identity and agency discussion of quote unquote a forgotten majority in migration discourse and politics. And an explicit and persistent rendering of this identity and agency has been the victimization of refugee women. So for instance, sexual violence perpetuated against refugee women was stressed as early as in the first world so survey on the role of women in development at the first United Nations World Conference on Women in 1987. And so in this context, refugee women were seen as vulnerable victims that carry a greater burden than their male counterparts and hereby needed specific um, accommodation. And while a series of international resolutions and policy statements throughout the 1980s called for specific protections of refugee women, research during this time, you know, largely neglected gendered analysis of flight and asylum. As Musa wrote in 1993, literature on refugees lacked gender distinction. The experience of refugee men was taken as the status quo of quote unquote, the refugee experience altogether. And really driving this home is a quote by Doreen Indra, who studied South Asian refugees in Canada, that captures this absence of a gendered analysis in refugee research at the time. Uh, Indra states, quote, people are refugees first, 
women and men second, and gender is never a variable, end quote. So from this, then in, in, in around the 1990s, the push for empowerment of refugee women was heavily advocated, but not by refugee women, but by women who are not refugees. And so feminist discourse on refugee women pushed towards an understanding of refugee experiences as gendered and acknowledged that the way in which refugees are defined by the state matters to their experiences. So it is within this, this kind of context that human rights approaches began to influence with refugee women's discourse. Here, three main human rights themes were prevalent in discussions on women's rights as human rights as it pertains to refugee women. Women's rights as human rights include the right to protection for refugee women, the right to safety and security for refugee women, and lastly, agency for refugee women. And so following this rights affirming trajectory of the 1990s, discourse on refugee women in the early 2000s took a critical turn, uh, specifically as it concerns accountability of refugee rights. Influential to this critical turn was the assessment by the Women's Refugee Commission of the UNHCR policy on refugee women in 2002. So the Women's Refugee Commission found that states fail to fulfill their obligations under international law, uh, that refugee women's participation in decision making was limited, and that specific challenges that refugee women face were not adequately addressed. So this was in the early 2000s. And I would argue that not much of progress, unfortunately, has, has been made. And more specifically, I would argue that this lack of progress has been intentionally designed by institutions, um, including particularly aid and government institutions and media, to continue to conceive of refugee women as vulnerable rather than resilient. And it is this purposeful design that has framed the history of gender negligence in migration discourse and politics and that is also inherently negligent towards any other forms of oppression or marginalization. So if we accept this kind of premise that I laid out here of intentional structural and institutional design in the ways that conceptions of vulnerability and resilience operate, where do we go from here? And so within my, my different roles, I, I, I propose chartering new ways of understanding how and where knowledge is produced. So speaking to um, what was just mentioned by, by Omrim, who is vulnerable, who is resilient, and who is to say? And so to answer these questions necessitates that we situate these historical, structural, and institutional designs of vulnerability and resilience within post-colonial and critical race theory approaches. This is especially urgent when we think of the securitization of migration and notorious what I have referred to as protection frames that have been used to further nationalist, right-wing, populist, and you know, let's be clear, racist trajectories. And I'm speaking here to conceptions and practices of quote unquote, protecting the European way of life, for instance. So it's my firm opinion that in order to understand historical, structural, and institutional designs of vulnerability and resilience, we have to interrogate or better yet challenge or dismantle the securitization protection nexus in contemporary migration discourse and po politics, particularly in Europe. And I agree with scholars such as Ibrahim that the securitization of migration is inherently a debate about race. Ibrahim argues that by shifting the focus from human rights to security, cultural difference as a system of classification has premised the association of rights of, of migrants with threats. Through this mechanism, migrants have been turned into agents that threaten security, while at the same time being the ones that face insecurity themselves, the war and persecution. And the same goes for conceptions of vulnerability and resilience as this mechanism of or design establishes hierarchies of protection and, and personhood. So when these hierarchies of protection and personhood in conceptions of vulnerability and resilience are then applied to migrant or refugee women specifically, an additional layer of purposeful gender design comes into play. Uh, El Tayeb explores, uh, explores this extensively in her work on queering ethnicity in Europe, for instance. El Tayeb identifies a double bind for racialized populations such as migrants. An internalist perspective of European exceptionalism and a universalist narrative that presents European identity as human, while other non-Western parts of the world are perceived as inevitably deviating from this norm. 
And so this other ring of anyone non-Western plays out strikingly around gendered European Muslim migrant difference in which, quote unquote, the violent male and the veiled young woman become the central other of the unifying Europe, exemplifying everything it is and cannot be. So this conception of Muslim women, specifically Muslim migrant and refugee women being everything that Europe is not and cannot be, speaks precisely to this purposeful historical, structural, and institutional design of vulnerability and resilience that we're addressing today. So I will stop here and I thank you and I really look forward to kind of discussing this further. Thank you, Dr. Lara, thank you so much. Wow. Thank you, all of you, uh, the speaker. I, I really want to share a very quick reflection, which I am really feeling because uh, from last few years, I've been intensively involved in the debate of refugee and migrant uh, women, especially how to link them and how to bring them in the inclusion of refugees, so-called European standards of life. And there's a perception these refugee women, they do not want to work they don't have potential or there's so many uh, extra resources they're asking about. But look at us, we all are refugee migrant women and we are talking about a very serious issue here. So thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so happy. Uh, I'm just uh, scrolling down the chat. We have received so many questions, but uh, being a moderator, I will take this privilege to ask you a question. Uh, so uh, I will start with um, uh, Amanda. I would like to ask you uh, a very, relevant question about your presentation or your talk, which you said, like you talk about the positive aspect of regarding the role of digital uh, technology in the enhancing migrant refugee women agency. Can you further elaborate on the ways in which the same technology can actually uh, heighten their voices and uh, you know their presence instead of they giving them a visibility as a leaders, they are still uh, putting them as a vulnerable. So what you think about that? Yeah, very inspiring talks. Uh, um, yeah, and I think it's really connected to, uh, to what we all have shared. We do have to leverage on the potential of, of digital storytelling, um, of, uh, well, in terms of producing alternative forms of knowledge, as I mentioned here in the chat, and digital technologies is there for it. So we've seen, uh, well, a lot of, uh, of, of support through networks of, of support in digital, in digital media and, and social media, sorry. Um, the, the use of these technologies, indeed, they have a, a very positive, um, uh, they can have a very, pos a very positive effect and, uh, and influence on migrant and refugee women's lives, but at the same time, uh, there are certain things, and we know that these spaces, social media spaces, the, the machine itself is not a neutral space, right? And uh, for instance, if we talk about data, um, we, are, we are living in, um, we're now totally, let's say, um, we have to navigate this space because basically everything that we do, all kinds of initiatives, all kinds of networks, we are generating data. So we need to understand these, um, the data mechanisms to be able to also protect ourselves. So what I'm trying to, do, to say with this is, for example, uh, technologists can also have um, very negative consequences when you do not understand these codes, when you do not understand that certain data, certain um, uh, information that is you know, produced in those spaces, um, they can become, you know, they can be weaponized against one. And uh, what I'm, I mean, I'm generalizing here, but what I'm trying to say with this is that this is something crucial, important, and we need to, um, let's say, to mobilize ourselves even more to understand how this, um, these data mechanisms work and to what extent we can leverage on them. And of course, at the same time, protect our privacy uh, our privacy, not only in the online sphere, but also in the physical um, sphere, because everything that happens online has a reflection on the offline and vice versa. So this is something to, so we need to understand digital experimentations are important, but we also need to care about the data that is there. And that's the point I'm making about, you know, technology, social media spaces, initiatives that can also bring 
negative consequences, especially when you have to negotiate I different identities and uh, social cultural conventions or if expectations. And now dealing with the government, we know that there is state surveillance. There's a lot of, uh, um, well, issues in that regard when we talk about securitization of migration and uh, the lives of... I think I got, I also heard myself at the back. <laughs> All right, just to conclude, um, it is really important to understand, um, to, to, to have the opportunity to, to understand what these technologies can offer, us, can offer us and how we can better, we can really, uh, you know, really leverage on them. They can also have negative effects. I just gave some examples here, but I'm very happy to, to discuss with you if you have any ideas to, about this. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. I, I like to now uh, open the floor for the Q&A. And I already see a few questions from uh, Razan. She is a part of New Woman Connector chapter of Spain. And Razan, if you are there, you are. Yes, please feel free to ask <laughs> your question. Uh, hi, thank you so much, everybody, for your um for your insights, it's been um, very, very insightful. It's, uh, you know, sometimes we think that our uh, struggles are not the same, but eventually they are. Unfortunately, they are, although we are very, very different women. Um, so uh, I just wanted to ask Juliana, uh, we were talking about like how the victimization of immigrant women is being perpetualized uh, or per perpetuated. Uh, how can we as individuals change that? Um, you know, not all of us have the, have a platform, not uh, everyone have, you know, they can, not everyone can raise their voice, especially in the, in the technology time, not everyone has access to technology. So how can we, how do you think that as individuals, we can, um, you know, stop it from being perpetuated? What, what do you think? To Juliana, the question, I think she was talking about that. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, because my internet was broke in the middle. Uh, okay. So if I understand no. your question is how you can use your own individual platform to uh, stop perpetuating um, racism and anti-migrant discrimination. Well, uh, everything starts with um, education. And then um, education in the sense that we have to decolonize our minds. Um, it's a new perspective, it's a new world. Um, the same way that we try to uh, understand patriarchy and how we are now, in the, like we have a very strong movement on gender, it's necessary to have the same process uh, on migration. Again, understanding that um, migration is under the frames of different oppressions and we are talking about not only colonialism, patriarchy as well, but capitalism, um, Christianity, not everybody is a Christian in the world, um, and all the forms of oppression. So it's necessary that um, we have higher education on decolonization, first of all. Second of all, that we um, engage in conversations in a constructive manner. Do not forget that the issue of racism as the issue of xenophobia or anti-migrant hatred is always uh, placed from the perspective of white people, from white anxiety, white fragility, and it's time to shift it. So again, making people understand that we as people of color, I, I know I'm just using again another umbrella term to say migrants and migrant women. We as people of color, we are not an homogeneous group, as you said, we are heterogeneous. When you talk about women that are migration, you're not just talking about the same category that are multi-dimensions of how we migrate, when we migrate, and how we stay or not. Um, and it's about as well on um, claiming and um, being more intersectional. So I think in a way, intersectionality is not only about how policies needs to understand, understand the different intersections of identities, but how, so how we as movement can mobilize intersectionally. So it's time as a platform, uh, an individual uh, to join forces with all the movements that are already engaged 
um, the, there is always a racial perspective in anything in the world, not only economy, not only of social policies, even on climate. We are, climate is structural racism. The way climate justice was built or injustice was, were built, they were built on structural institutional racism. So I think it's, um, we have to get a, a deep uh, conversation, deep study, uh, use the platform to use it more, because otherwise it just become, again, another period uh, in the world, a kind of racism spring that nobody will follow up upon afterwards. So I think the, um, the individual platform, even if it's on your universe, if it's with your neighbor, if it's with your grandmother, if it's with your colleague, the, the, the parties that you vote, start these conversations. And again, representation is important, but representation is important with demands and programs, otherwise it's tokenism. So I'm pro-women in politics, I'm pro-migrants in politics, um, political parties as leaders, with the condition we are not just numbers. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Razan, for this question. Uh, I would like to one more question ask to Amrain because uh, Amrain, uh, you spoke about your intensive uh, interaction with refugee and migrant women in Europe uh, for your research. So I would like to know, like, as you are share these examples, and we are now living in COVID nineteen, and we can't ignore this perspective, our real. Uh, reality we are all living together so what's your experience and observation wh uh, while you are conducting this uh, uh, research any examples of solidarity uh, exercised by refugee and migrant women in times of COVID-19 um, yes and uh, thank you uh, Anila this is a very relevant question uh, Thank you for asking this. Um, in fact, there are many stories uh, and many um, examples of uh, solidarity and uh, exercise by the refugees within their communities, but also uh, within the larger communities. Uh, and I can share one with you, maybe two, maybe a couple of them. Um, for example, the story that uh, one can find uh, within many migrant and refugee com uh, communities during COVID-19 lockdown, uh, lockdown times. In the Muslim month of uh, Ramadan, uh, which actually happened during uh, the lockdown time here in the Netherlands, uh, Muslim communities uh, uh, share zakat as sharing resources with the needy. So uh, the Pakistani migrant community distributed at least 100 ready to eat free food boxes every day to the needy. Uh, and this means around 700 to 800 uh, food boxes every week, just in the city of The Hague. So the question uh, is, does anyone know about it? I mean, nobody heard about it. Uh, is it a, a gesture of solidarity towards the, uh, is this gesture of solidarity uh, uh, towards the vulnerable and needy highlighted anywhere? Is this positive uh, aspect of uh, uh, refugees and migrants uh, in this city of The Hague, which is very much in focus during uh, uh, the COVID-19 lockdown? Uh, nobody knows about it. Similarly, as many of the refugee uh, women have not uh, learned Dutch language to the level that they can help their children in schoolwork um, during the school closures in the lockdown times, there were some women uh, from uh, uh, migrant women and refugee women who knew Dutch. They organized online lessons for the children free of charge for the mothers who were unable to help their children do the school work in Dutch language, you know, they help them free of charge online. So I think these are very beautiful and very powerful examples of how the community shows and ex uh, uh, expresses solidarity amongst themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Amreen. Thank you so much. Uh, 
there are so many questions I like to ask, but obviously I want to give the floor to other participants as well. So I see a hand from Ifat Gil. She like to ask a question. So Ifat, over to you. Hi. Um, I'm just noticing my background. Um, thank you for the tips at the start of the webinar telling us about the, the background. Um, uh, thank you so much for uh, your all of your presentations. I'm, I'll be quick. Uh, I had a question for Amreen. I think it's very important what you said that it's it's really matters who is asking the question. Um, um, and uh, I think yes, then there's a higher chance that we'll get very different results as well. Um, but I was very curious to know um, approaching these women and speaking to these women and, and encouraging them to share their stories, how approachable were they and um, how um, uh, easy was it for you or difficult was it for you to, to get them to share their stories. Um, and then I think it's, it's really interesting what, also what Amanda said um, about um, the bias in the, in the code that is out there, in the data that is out there, and in the algorithms that are out there, you get a very different set of results if you type uh, something about black girls, for example, um, and the kind of stereotypes. So of course, not in this age of artificial intelligence and machine learning, whatever we are, and we are biased human beings, uh, that is what the computers uh, or the algorithms are learning, and that is what they are churning out. And it's it's going to to just build up on that, um, and that is a very dangerous thing. I need I think we need to address that. However, I, I do want to hear more about what what can we do to to counter this. Thank you so much. Amanda, would you like to go first or shall I? Yeah, you, know, you, you go first and then I will ask uh, Lara, Amanda and Julia uh, now to add their comments as well. Well, I think uh, uh, if uh, the answer uh, sort of lies in the question itself, because uh, uh, how one responds uh, depends on some key factors and language being the most important one. So there is an instant connection when you share a language. Uh, for me, I've been working with women uh, from a uh, Pakistani background, from a um, uh, Syrian background. But then I felt that after, since I did not share the language uh, with the Syrian women, English came to help, you know. So uh, with Pakistani women, it was an instant connection. They would start talking to you, start sharing details with you, and would not feel hesitant because maybe they trust you. Uh, and they, they have this feeling of belongingness uh, with you. But uh, otherwise, you have to spend a little bit of time with, the, uh, with your collaborators. And this is why uh, the approach of collaborative research uh, takes time. It's, 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 uh, uh, it is formed on the basis of building relationships. And only then you, point, uh, you reach to the point of ease where people open up, where uh, participants are not just participants, but become uh, collaborators in your research and start giving you ideas on what to do, for example, one of uh, my research collaborator um, um, gave a very good idea of uh, using uh, songs, you know, as before telling the story. So they take initiative, they feel the belonging, and but it takes a little bit of time for relationship building. Thank you. Yes, yes. Amanda. Yes. Uh, well, thank you for the question. Uh, this. This is a very uh, challenging one. I'm, I'm not quite sure whether I have a particular uh, concrete answer to you, Ifat, but I have some ideas here. Um, I guess one of the first things, and, uh, and that includes me at least, uh, we need to understand and identify, first of all, how these uh, digital systems, how these algorithms work, um, how they operate, how they are linked to, as you mentioned in the chat here, how they're linked to our societies, our backgrounds, our contexts, 
and the implications of them to the physical world back then, back to the physical world. And, um, and once we understand we have this literacy, because it requires a set of, of skills, right? We need to, uh, to sort of, um, uh, I would say, I think it's urgent. It's urgent that we, uh, that we start understanding how these infrastructures work. But unfortunately, well, there are several ways and it doesn't have to be necessarily through colonial ways of, uh, of, uh, of thinking about digital uh, algorithms and et cetera. There are, I mean, several initiatives out there already with, uh, with proposals of how to implement uh, those trainings in a more, uh, well, in a more situated contextualized uh, manner. Another thing that it's also very important is that um, I also, again, don't have the, the, the concrete answer for on how this could be done, but it's also urgent that we, we recognize and we mobilize infrastructures at the power level, at the, at the, yeah, at the policy level, because there are several um, digital infrastructures and initiatives and, and, and systems that are being implemented by governments uh, that contribute to oppress people, right? And then we have, of course, the, the big giants, global di giants out there, that they also have their own systems. And, and, um, and again, I'm not quite sure I'm answering your question the way you were expecting, but I think uh, that this could be a good starting point, a productive starting point. We need to understand, we need to mobilize um, against these infrastructures, these algorithms of oppression. Thank you, Manda. Lara, I would like to ask you to add your comments and then I will go to Juliana. And I see, Juliana, you also want to ask something or add something. So after Lara, feel free to go. Yeah, can I, I go? Yeah, Juliana, go ahead because I actually don't, I'm not in a position to answer this question. So please go ahead. Ah, okay. Thank you, Lara. Um, I just want to bring, um, a new perspective on artificial intelligence because in our since um, 2028 2018 is trying to understand how artificial intelligence is affecting the fundamental rights of migrants and other racialized groups we have launched a report in december we are going to launch another one now in um in the end of the year so on how artificial intelligence is impacting the lives of people like us, migrants in, in Europe. Um, I would just want to give four elements, and I just throw it there for information and reflection. First of all, it's important to mention that 70% of the tools, the database, the algorithms that are done in, in the artificial intelligence world, in the word tech, are done from previous law enforcement authorities. So it means that you can Sorry, uh, um, okay. Yafa, you have to mute yourself, please. Someone can mute Yafa? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, yeah, because otherwise it's sorry. too much. Yeah, so 70% of these tools of this uh, tech business uh, um, are composed of previous law enforcement um, agents. So people from the police, people from the uh, military service, people from um, security intelligence. So they are the mind behind how the data is created, how, how organisms are created how our digital identity is created. So what it means that um, algorithms are already created via a securization approach, via a, 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 a perspective of security, even if they are commercialized. So this is an important element to also to, to understand why we're talking about the importance of um, attribution intelligence. It's not only how it's collected, but also who is creating these this, this digital uh, prints. Second of all, I want to also mention that there was a, a white paper um, in consultation until the 14th of June um, on a white paper on uh, artificial intelligence it's called uh, European Approach, so the new agenda on artificial intelligence for Europe, and there was no chapter on fundamental rights, zero. 
the discussion is still around regulation, still around high risks, but not on the, via the lenses of fundamental rights. Third one is that we had a report launched, like I mentioned, called hardwiring. Hardwiring, what is hardwiring? Is when um, you incorporate historical uh, police practice and you uh, add to it the technology. So if you have already an abusive police that conducts racial profiling, that beats on migrants on, 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 on the borders, who do not let, uh, who is pro, uh, organizing pushbacks against these minorities, plus the tech that is already discriminatory, you have a kind of boom, an explosion, an uh, extra layer of racism in terms of protection. So in this data, what, they, what we find is that they are disproportionately affecting minorities, especially migrants, because we are over police and other protected. Second of all, technologies are, mis are not designed to identify us. We are misidentified all the time. Take a look at the question of facial recognition and why the met police in the UK. They stopped using it because it, they, they could not um, justify why they were targeting more and more people of color and migrants and black people. And third one is that the technology is constructed to see people like us as a risk. So that's what they were calling like the, there is an element of geographic, so by, by where you live and where you stay or where you come from, plus another element of, um, of identity. So the uh, geolocalization geo uh, component plus the identity component is how we are defined as risks, especially in the field of migration. So we have an extra target in our bank. And just to finalize, we're going to launch in December uh, this year a report on how artificial intelligence is affecting employment and recruitment. And if you think with me, if you were, if you have submitted an application to find a job recently, you're going to agree with me that you only talk to ma machines, you talk to robots. You're only going to see the people, the person um, who are going to recruit you in the end. But if you understand that this data discriminates, for example, your language skills, do you have the good accent? Do you have the wrong accent? Um, do you write in the same way people in this country write? We are not educated in the same way. We have writing skills, drafting skills that are totally different. If you don't match the category of the, of the information of the algorithm, you're never going to go across, across to get an interview. So this is, again, um, trying to understand how these tools are preventing integration. So you have to talk to talk and walk the walk. If you do a new package on migration, you have also to understand how artificial intelligence is preventing integration of migrants. Thank you, Juliana. Uh, you really highlighted the last sentence, uh, which remind me the EU pact of migration, which is on hold because of COVID. And that's the question I really like to ask Lara, Dr. Lara, from you, because as you know, uh, European Commission and all the European countries, they are on the extreme uh, sensitive level and they are controlling their borders. They close their borders and they are closing every policy related to integration of refugee and migrant. And this all situation is giving us again worry, like we are not important, we are still remaining as a burden. So what do you see in addressing how we got here and where to go next? How do you conceive of this addressing anti-racist efforts in migration politics and discourse is still is making more complex even COVID-19 and post-COVID-19? What will be the future for us? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for this question. Um, I think right now around, around the world, we're really at, a, at this pivotal moment as it concerns racial justice and also migrant justice, So, and especially in Europe. So as mentioned last week, the European Parliament adopted a re resolution on racial justice. This week, the European Commission met to discuss uh, racism in Europe. And at the same time, the issuance of the new EU Pact on Migration and Asylum that has been awaited for so long um, has been postponed. So to me, and this is also what, what my NGO, the, the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice has recommended, is that this new EU Pact on Migration and Asylum must really be rooted in anti-racist, rights-based, gender-responsive, action-driven knowledge and knowledge-driven action. And I know this has been mentioned several times already, but it's so important that 
these racial justice efforts must be connected to migrant justice issues and vice versa because of what has been outlined, right? The securitization of migration, these notorious protection frames that are inherently about race. Um, and we have seen this over and over again in the ways that immigration enforcement acts, that border patrol acts, and this behavior doesn't come from nowhere, right? It's really, it's rooted in historical, structural, and institutional designs in which police violence is managed by the same agencies as uh, border patrol. So seeing the same strategies and methods being used in instances of violence across the board, whether at, at, at the border um, or elsewhere, from racial injustice to immigration enforcement, that this is no coincidence, right? It, it is designed to do what it does, and it it must be dismantled. That's that's the bottom line of it. And, and this dismantling, in my opinion, begins with connecting racial justice efforts with migrant justice efforts as they're not mutually exclusive, but rather they're mutually reinforcing. Thank you, Dr. Lara. Uh, so we almost in the last session, uh, minutes of our uh, today's event. And I really like to ask all of you who are in this session, in this event, either panelists or speakers, what do you think, how we can, say enough is enough how we can say stop like we are not burdened we are capable and take us as a resilient how you think we need to put as a way forward regardless of limits of resources which we have especially refugee and migrant led woman led uh, initiative we see there's a lack of collaboration they are taking us still as a beneficiary not as a partner so how we can say it stop and especially how to create policy more feminist, sensitive, and gender uh, responsive a policy is still being uh, ignored. And they are, they are not talking about it. They're still taking migrants and refugees their business. And this is a question, I know it's a weak question, which I'm asking. But still, in our experience uh, 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 conducting this um, uh, platform of uh, refugee and migrant women voices, I, I felt this is big responsibility on us as well. How we can put it like to say a shout out, enough is enough. So what do you think, how we can uh, create more collaboration to show more solidarity so they can see we are strong and we, re we are here for, for this change. So we, I will start with Amanda. I was here to focus on <laughs> chatting. <laughs> Great dialogue also happening. Um, I, I would just summarize a bit. I, I really, I, we were talking about ethics here, uh, ethics and technologies, ethics and politics um, uh, and policies and ethics among the community, right? Uh, and and how, uh, how solidarity and this really, um, the importance of really caring about or position yourself in relation to the others, how you, you envision uh, the, the reality, the present, the future, but also how the past connect uh, to, uh, to possibilities for, uh, for envisioning better realities, better futures. So I think care ethics and uh, are key, and we need to be able to make this more universal, I would say, and policies uh, in our communities and in technologies especially, um, and uh, yeah, I do think that these debates, these discussions we are having here are extremely relevant. And uh, not only because we are uh, producing knowledge, we are learning um, well, with each other, we are discussing uh, issues that are affecting us, how we can you know, resist, mobilize, um, and become even more resilient at the everyday life, um, in community, collectively, individually. Um, so I think that's the way. Um, and um, yes. Thank you, Amanda. Yes, Amreen. Thank you, Anila. Uh, well, I think uh, I can answer your question um, uh, by relating it uh, in two uh, uh, segments. First, the policy. You um, mentioned how can we uh, have more informed policy? Well, policy is informed by evidence. And uh, so uh, I think a concrete step would be more research by the migrants, uh, 
by the refugees, uh, with the refugees um, would be one way. And then second, uh, advocacy, I think that would be uh, very much helpful if it is informed by um, more um, um, by refugees again. And, you know, with inputs uh, from uh, refugee and migrant groups like uh, uh, yourself or maybe others uh, in the network who are uh, working directly with the migrants and refugee populations. And secondly, at the social level, I think um, I would say events like these, you know, that open up spaces, that provide a platform, a space to uh, uh, open discussions and to share uh, the stories. And these stories can be in many forms. Uh, I have seen the most connecting ones can be uh, through using diverse mediums like uh, songs, um, uh, like sharing uh, art to art. So uh, these can be very effective. So if we can um, organize some things around um, uh, sharing stories to arts, videos, songs, um, during, uh, using digital platforms, I think that would be another good way. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Juliana, I will uh, slightly change my question for you specifically because you are based in Brussels and you have witnessed and being involved in all discussion and still is uh, racism is becoming more and more structured and is rooted. Uh, so how you think using refugee and migrant women voices related to the policy and how we can be make more careful action to say we, we really don't want to be tokenized because still we win just tick box is happening with us. So how you think we can uh, stand against this action and we can be there as a collaborator and designing of the policies? Yeah, it's important in terms of policy, it's important, especially in the field of uh, racism migration, it's important to understand that the most of the discussions are taking place without us already. So um, it's also important to know that there is very little pre-assessment of previous engagement. Um, and of course, uh, to understand um, the previous commitments and how effective they are or were is a first step. However, I think, first of all, as individuals, it's necessary that we have very uncomfortable conversations. And um, we do not need to be scared of having them. We need to bring people outside of the comfort zone. Um, and for example, if I have my privilege as in our to bring new women's connectors to the table, I use my privilege. If you have your privilege as a migrant woman to bring a black woman to the table, a black migrant woman, you bring, you use that privilege for that. If you are American and you see that um, we are here isolated voices in the, uh, in the in Europe and you need this message to be amplified, so use your privilege, love your space um, to generate that. In Portuguese, I'm, 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 I'm a Portuguese native speaker, there is an expression that is very difficult to translate, probably Amanda can help me, that is called uh, lugar de fala. So it's, from the, um, it's a space from where you talk so you cannot talk about something without the person because um, you don't understand the different dimensions, the standpoint. Thank you. Um, and then, um, and that's it, is to use that place that you have to take these conversations. We've seen many of, for example, lately, we've seen many um, uh, artists, social media, um, celebrities uh, who are white, giving their space to black women to talk about the experience of racism. So I think it's also a place where we have to demand more. It's a, we have to claim, we, and why not shame? Sometimes blame and shame is useful. <laughs> uh, and, and we have, because blame and shame is putting people out of the comfort zone. Um, in terms of policies, I think as well, um, we have to unify voices and platforms and be able to be a unified front in everything we do. So co sign positions, bring, uh, generate um, cross-reference data. If you have data, let's share, let's bring your data to the policy table discussions. 
Um, and use of media. I think we are not using media as allies. We have to change this role of media um, and bring them to discussion. Do not forget that why George Floyd is widely covered in the US is because you have a media that widely covers that every day without any kind of uh, um, like fear. So they are not scared to, 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 to portray how people are being abused. So, yes, but uh, I think we are in a really crucial moment in history where we can shift. So I think by mobilizing ourselves as a like being united, we can bring some for, like a, a small changes in the future. But it's just a start, just a start. Thank you, Juliani. I know it's a, just a start and long way to go, but we are not getting tired to raising our voice. So, Lara, you have the last words to say and then I will sum up, yes. That, that's a very, very big task to, to have the, 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 the last words. But I, I think I, I want to drive home one, one aspect, and, and Juliana mentioned this, which is kind of the, the, the importance of an anti-capitalist approach um, in how we move forward. And I've been talking about kind of like redesigning these perceptions of vulnerability and, and resilience. And to me, this first really necessitates challenging uh, structures and institu institutions that have upheld and re reinforced these conceptions. And this, in my opinion, can only be done through a feminist, anti-racist, and anti-capitalist approach, which is premised on decolonizing knowledge and practices of migration, discourse, and politics. So what does this mean? It, to me, this means going beyond gender mainstreaming, going beyond um, diversity and inclusion efforts, and also not letting economics drive humanitarian um, efforts. Because it is no secret that big corporations such as McKinsey, for example, have shaped Europe's migration discourse and politics uh, for years. And I'll give you just a quick kind of example from Germany. Um, so in 2015, the German government called in McKinsey to streamline its asylum procedures. Um, Germany has paid McKinsey millions of euros for asylum decisions to be handed down by the Federal Migration Office to increase the decision making, which has left an increasing number of migrants with fewer rights, um, above all the right for family re reunification. Um, and that has really triggered thousands of appeals that have created a new backlog in German courts. And so these fast track decisions have majorly impacted conceptions of vulnerability in migration discourse and politics. While resilience, so these appeals that are happening in, in the courts to, to, to fight these deep structures and this influence of, of capitalism within migration discourse and politics have been mainly sidelined side from this conventional debate um, and action. So what is, what is to be done, and I'm, I'm reiterating here kind of the stance that uh, my NGO, the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice has, has taken, is that we believe that gender justice beyond borders really necessitates shared agency, representation, and accountability in migration discourse and politics. And this means shrinking spaces, literally and figuratively, between migrant communities and governing bodies as kind of the baseline to move forward towards owning a seat at the head of the table where decisions and discussions are being held over who is vulnerable and who is resilient. Thank you, Lara. Thank you so much. Uh, I think I don't have to say much. You already say a lot, all of you. I, I really thank all of you. And I think what's next and who is resilient and who is not vulnerable. And there's, as Lara, you said, there's limited uh, spaces. And that's what we are trying to do at New Woman Connector. We are trying to create our own spaces led by us, led by women who are resilient. And we all are sharing our resilience and our empowerment with each other because we already hold empowerment. We don't need someone come and tell us that we need empowerment or not, but, but need resources and uh, more opportunity to show it. And we are doing very good. And in the last moment, I will say where to next and how we can go. And as I already said in the start, um, Leading Resilience is a series of webinars and I really like all of you to stay connected and that's what we uh, do as a connector. We like to be connected uh, with each other and I'm gonna share my screen again. <laughs> so you, um, you can know uh, the digital way of our 
connection. Uh, as I said, we have a, a pile up and uh, a planning uh, uh, multiple uh, webinars, even in the different languages. One is coming up very soon on 22nd of July or in Arabic. All the audience who speak and like to be feel comfortable to speak because it's important the voice they are sharing, it should be feel comfortable for them. Uh, one is Arabic, other is in Spanish is coming up on 25th of July and we're also planning in Urdu, which is my mother tongue and Punjabi and Hindi and Pashto and other languages. Uh, we are planning to do more webinar. And also we have created a uh, Let's Chat and Talk a WhatsApp group if you like to be talk about uh, your situation or solidarity or just to feel like we are coping together, growing together, a feeling of solidarity. So be in touch with us. You have our emails and we really trying not to monitor the impact of COVID-19 of refugee and migrant women, but we really trying to make sure after the passage, the tunnel of COVID-19, when it's ended, we come with a good gender sensitive and equal and equality based uh, future for everyone. So thank you so much everyone for having us and staying connected. And if you have any question or any comment, do connect with us and coping together, growing together. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone.